much more scientific chemistry. Increasingly, the knowledge of the alchemists found more and more practical applications. For instance, when, during the last decade of the 7th century, the ruler of the Islamic Empire, Abdul Malik, made the bold decision to create a common currency for all his dominions, he turned to alchemists for help. The proportion of gold to other alloyed metals that you have to put into the dinar to make the dinar usable, otherwise pure gold will become uh, very soft and you can't use it. So that proportion is adjusted by, believe it or not, in this period, the alchemists. It is the alchemists who knew how to combine metals together and how to get the proportions of this gold to silver and gold to uh, bronze and so on. I hunted down tangible evidence of the skill of medieval Islamic alchemists in the old market in the Syrian capital, Damascus. This is an Islamic dinar. The date of this is 128 after Hijri. So the middle of the 8th century, seven, almost, almost, almost the 7, yeah, in the of the This 1,300-year-old coin, made of an alloy of different metals, isn't just durable. It's also malleable enough to be inscribed with intricate Arabic writing. No God in the stock of Allah in the... Uh, Coin making is one of the many examples of how the practical needs of a booming economy began to turn the magical practice of alchemy into modern chemistry. What's striking about chemistry in the medieval Islamic world is the sheer quantity of manuscripts that deal with the subject. There are literally thousands that survive dealing with subjects as varied as metallurgy, glass making, tile making, dyeing, perfumery, weaponry. There's even a description on how to distill alcohol. All this activity clearly points to a bustling economy with consumers, soldiers, engineers, architects, all demanding innovation and all demanding new technology. A great example of applied chemistry in the medieval Islamic world was the manufacture of soap. This stuff, solid soap that you can really clean yourself with, was virtually unknown in northern Europe until the 13th century when it started being imported from Islamic Spain and North Africa. By that time, the manufacture of soap in the Islamic world had become virtually industrialized. The town of Fez boasted some 27 different soap makers and cities like Nablus, Damascus, and of course Aleppo became world-renowned for the quality of their soaps. A 12th century document has the world's first detailed description of how to make soap. It mentions a key ingredient, and it's a substance that became crucial to modern chemistry, an alkali. Now, alkaline substances are crucial to soap making. But what's interesting is that our word alkali derives from the Arabic alkali, which means ashes. That's because back then, alkalis were manufactured from the ashes of the roots of certain plants like saltworts. Islamic chemists' new understanding of alkalis and other new chemicals gave another industry a lift too, glass making. The Islamic chemists discovered that they could change the colour of glass using newly discovered chemicals like manganese salts. And they built industrial furnaces, some several storeys high, to manufacture glass in huge quantities. The legacy of their skills can still be seen in beautiful stained glass windows. Islamic chemists also developed many other colours, pigments and dyes using their new alkalis and metals like lead and tin. These helped architects to decorate mosques like this one in the Iranian city of Isfahan in a glorious range of colours and designs.
chemistry was also driven by the booming market in perfumes. <laughs> in the main market in Damascus, traders still make up your favorite scent as they would have a thousand years ago. So it basically has a base of alcohol and then he adds to it the, uh, the, the oils from the plants that you want. Jasmine and, and, and rose water and, and uh, mint. But these days they'll, they'll, they'll use... Um, very nice. Yeah, I think I'll buy some of that. Perfumiers pushed chemists to come up with ever more ingenious techniques for extracting subtle and fragile fragrances from flowers and plants. They responded by refining and really establishing a technique that all chemists would instantly recognize today. Distillation. Many of the techniques originate with Islamic scholars or even earlier. Dr. Andrea Sella, a chemist from the University College London, shows me how distillation was used. Distillations would have been done in devices sort of related to these. This is what's now called a, a retort, and we don't really use them anymore, but retort comes from the, from the word to bend. In other words, a flask which has been bent over, and that's crucial. Well, many of the, the shape means that a gas produced in the flask is forced to condense in the spout, and it's the main way of extracting scents from flowers and plants. Now, the idea here is that you heat at this end and you collect at the other. And so we should actually take a look and see if we can do a quick distillation with rose petals. First, we need to just put in a little bit of water. The water steam will essentially control the temperature. What we don't want is for this to get too hot. Um, because the trick with this kind of distillation is to use heat to release the scent molecules but at the same time making sure that these delicate substances aren't destroyed in the process. You actually use the steam to control the temperature and the steam will carry the, those smells over. You can see the liquid coming up condensing in the long tube and there is already okay. liquid oh, coming, coming over. Through, yeah. And that should be carrying with it some of the sort of rose water smell. Mm, yes, you can really spell it. This picture shows a 14th century perfume distillery. Middle Eastern perfumes were known to have been sold as far away as India and China. The Islamic chemists also played a pivotal role in another more gruesome industry, weaponry. Historical records during the Crusades talk in terrified tones of how the Muslims would attack the Christians with burning missiles and grenades, striking fear into the hearts of the defenders. Many of these use a substance known as Greek fire. Islamic chemists improved on Greek fire by using and refining a naturally occurring resource, petroleum. They developed the idea of distilling petroleum, or nuft, to create a lighter, extremely flammable oil, which they mixed with other volatile chemicals to make them burn furiously. And the result was clearly terrifying. What all these medieval Islamic texts on chemistry have in common is their great attention to detail, which is clearly based on careful experimentation. In fact, the whole idea of a laboratory where chemical and industrial processes can be tried out really takes hold at this time. The ingenuity of medieval Islamic chemists is impressive. But I wanted to know something deeper. What contribution did they make to our modern understanding of the principles behind chemistry? This is the centerpiece of modern chemistry, the periodic table. It lists all the known elements. Its key idea is to group substances with similar properties together. On the far right, for instance, are the inert gases. On the far left are the volatile metals. The periodic table is a triumph of classification, giving scientists a way of organizing their knowledge of the material world. Classification is, is simply a way to think clearly. 
I mean, what you need when, when, you, when you have some ideas about how the world works is that gives you a kind of schema and you chop the world up into categories. And that actually helps you to understand, to, 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 to make sense of what's around you.